Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am truly, truly ready to deposit this word into the house of the Lord on this morning. Amen. I thank God because the atmosphere has been beyond set. Amen. Amen. And so I just pray that the Lord will just continue to have his way in this place as we get into the word of the Lord. Get your swords in your hand. Lift them up in the air as we go forward with our Bible declaration on this morning. Amen. Can everybody just shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. Amen. Come on, Amen. let us declare. This is my Bible. This is my sword. My instructions for life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I shall hear it, receive it, apply it, and obey. Share it with others who don't know the way. My heart is open, so have your way. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. In Jesus' name, I'll never be the same. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. Father, I pray that this word is sown on good ground, Lord God, and to the hearts of everyone that hears this word. Father, 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 just allow it to bring forth good fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My husband said it ain't about just coming to church. It's about change. That's the key. Because we can come to church. But when I said, no, nah, I, I was hearing him. I said, nope, it ain't about church. It's about change. And the title of this message is simply the fruit of change. Amen? Amen. And so I want to start off this message today. I want you all to repeat the slogan that I have put in the atmosphere on last week. I began to speak it prior to the first Sunday of the month. But I spoke it out last week. I had you all to repeat it. I put it on Facebook. And I said, I, I started the first part of it and I wanted everybody else that knew what it said to say it. Even if you saw all the other people in the comments, write it out. I wanted every individual to write it out themselves for a reason. Because sometimes you have to repeat something more than enough in order to really get it in your spirit. And we're trying to do some things different in this year. Amen? Amen. And so, I want you to repeat after me and say, I know I, know I, need, to I need to change. But if I don't change, I, don't change, I, will, never change. I will never change. Say it again. I know I, know I, need, to I need to change. But if I don't change, I, don't change, I, will, never change. I will never change. Change is, a necess is necessary for spiritual growth. Amen. Change is necessary for healing and deliverance. Change is necessary in life, period. But people don't always like change. Right, right. And you have some people that straight up resist change. People are afraid of change because they don't know what the outcome will be if they do. Mm -hmm. See, see, some people in the kingdom of God are afraid to really sell all the way out because they don't know what their life will be like. If they really do. Common sense says that it will be better. But there's something about us that, that hesitate. We're giving God that full yes. We hesitate because for real there's a part of us that knows it's going to what? Require more of us. People are afraid of change because they don't know what the outcome will be if they do. People, my husband just spoke about men in control. And I thought about this. I said, people who like to be in control struggle with submitting to God. He said it's easier for women to submit. It's easier for women to worship. It's easier for women to commit. But it's a struggle a lot of times for men. Because guess what? A lot of times men, men want to be in control. And this whole God thing, humbling yourself, submitting yourself to somebody else, because you used to being the one that somebody submit to. But just because you're in position for someone to submit to you, it doesn't mean that you don't have to submit to anybody. But men struggle with that posture of humility and totally submitting. And sometimes, and it's not just men, but even when you think about my husband used the example of the power of a father. He used the power of a father because sometimes a mama will say stuff over and over, but a father can say it one time. And it changes things. But there's a struggle in the world today. 
Because so many individuals in the natural have not had good examples of fathers. So there's a lack of respect for men. There's a lack of respect for the father. Because a lot of them have been absent from the home. A lot of them haven't had good examples to look up to. So now, as a man, you want me to submit to a father. I don't even know what that looked like because I ain't never did it in my life. So it becomes a real struggle, a real battle. And again, it's not just for men. Women have this struggle too because broken homes are everywhere. And when you think about a father, a daddy that really loves you unconditionally, a daddy that chastises you and corrects you because we don't, we don't know nothing about that. So now we get into the kingdom of God and it becomes a real struggle. And so we saved and we in the body of Christ for a long time, but we ain't changing People who like to be in control struggle with submitting to God 100% because they know it requires change. They don't necessarily approve of. Because the key is, you know it requires change, but you ain't trying to change in the way that God wants you to change. You ain't trying to do what God wants you to really do. You don't approve of all that he wants you to do. You don't approve of everything in his word. Because guess what? I'll do this, but I, I still want to hold on to this. I ain't trying to get this up. So guess what? I know I need to, but because I'm not in control, I ain't trying to do it because I don't approve with what God wants me to do. Some people don't change because they don't think they need to change. You will never change if you think you are right. You will never change if you don't see a reason to change. And so others can see that you need to change. Somebody say need. Need. But because you don't see the fact that you need to change, you won't change. That's right. There's nothing wrong with you. Because you don't see absolutely nothing wrong with you. Some don't change, even though they know they should, because they just straight up stubborn. Some people are simply just plain old stubborn. They know what they need to do. Yeah, I know I need to change, but I'm not. Can I, can I be for real? Sometimes you get the stubborn people that know they need to change, and just because you told them they need to change, they refuse to change. See, because some people got that old lockdown spirit. You could be speaking all kinds of truth about what it is that they need to change, but because it came from you, I'm not going to do nothing. All you're doing is hurting yourself. All you're doing is hurting yourself. Because you're stubborn. When you think about the word stubborn, stubborn is defined as having or showing dogged determination. Mm. Mm. I'm going to put my heels in the ground on this one. I refuse to budge. Dogged determination not to change mm. one's attitude or position on something. Especially in spite of good arguments or reasons to do so. When individuals bring things to your life that's going to help you to be better, first of all, you got to catch it. They're trying to help you. They're not trying to hurt you. And you can see that what they're saying is positive. But again, because you're just stubborn, you won't change. There's a quote by a young man named Paul Wong. It says, when people are drowning in their miseries but refuse to change their ways, even God can't save them. Can I say that one more time? When people are drowning, overtaken, drowning in their miseries but refuse to change what? Their ways. See, a lot of times you try to change somebody else's ways, but you need to change your own ways. But when they refuse to change their ways, even God can't save them. I shared a conversation that Bishop Coletta Vaughn put out on Facebook before, a conversation that she actually had with God, and she put it out there, and it was so powerful. And the conversation went a little something like this. God said, you know, what's the most powerful thing in the earth, daughter? Her response to God was, the Holy Spirit. And the Lord said, no. And so Bishop Vaughn said, your word? And the Lord said, no. And then her thing was like, well, what is it? 
And the Lord said, the human will, not even I can override it. Not even I can override it. And he's God. But one of the things that he put on the inside of us is the human will. The ability to choose. You ain't never got to sell out to God. It's your choice. If you do, it's because you choose to. And if you don't, it is because you choose not to. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Thank you again, praise team, for just setting the atmosphere today. Thank you so much for just allowing God to just use you all in the way that he did. We're looking at John chapter 15. I just want to read verses 1 through 2. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 2. I'm reading this from the New King James Version of the Bible. I'll give you all the opportunity to get there. John chapter 15. Starting at verse 1, and we're going to read word 1 and 2, and it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. In some versions it says the gardener. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, in me, in me. See, what you got to catch is that when you are born again, you are in God. This ain't, a, this ain't a text about your salvation. Yeah. It says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Mm. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Because we can be in him, and guess what? Not bear any fruit. But we're in him. And so... Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. We have to understand that as children of God, we are supposed to bear fruit. Amen. And when you think about the pruning process, for those that are bearing fruit, we have to go through a pruning process. And the pruning process is necessary, amen? When you think about it, it involves a lot of work and it, a lot, it involves a lot of change, amen? It is not an easy process, but it's one that we must actually endure. It's one that's necessary and it's not always easy. You think about it, I, 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 I'm bearing fruit. Why you got to do this now? Because guess what? I got to cut off some stuff that will hinder the fruit that has already come forth. Because when you think about it, as you begin to grow, different things begin to come out. Good God from Zion. As you begin to grow in God, and as you begin to produce some good fruit, guess what? There's also some other stuff that begin to come out. And that's the stuff that needs to come out. And as it comes out, God is going to begin to cut it off. Because that is the very thing that can destroy the good fruit that has begun to blossom. And so... The process of pruning can be painful in the spirit, but it is worth it in the long run. The process of pruning, again, involves cutting off things that can keep the good fruit from growing or keep it from even coming forth. I'm talking about some people, uh-huh. I'm talking about some places. I'm talking about some things, amen. And so in this season of your life, God wants you to look within yourself. Because a lot of times when you say, yeah, you got to cut off some people, and you're looking at some other people, no, but God really wants you to take a look at yourself right about now. There may be some things and some people that you have to cut off, amen? There may be some places that you don't need to go anymore, and it's easy for us to focus on that. But in this season in your life, God wants you to focus on you. Don't be focused on who you need to cut off, who you need to unfriend, all that other stuff. God will make all that clear because as you draw closer to him, he will show you what to do and what not to do. Amen. And so in this season of your life, God wants you to look within yourself. My question to you today is, what kind of fruit are you producing? Mm. Is it good fruit or is it bad fruit? But let me ask you another question. Are you even producing any fruit? Or are you just barren? 
Or are you just barren? See, when you think, barren, when you think about something that's barren, barren is defined as something or someone who is not productive or fruitful. Connected in the kingdom. But ain't nothing happening. I mean, nothing. Nothing. Just barren. And so, what you have to understand, people of God, is from the moment that you get saved, you are immediately planted in the family of God. Keep in mind fruit. Keep in mind trees. Keep in mind vines. Keep these things in mind. So when you think about it, when you say yes to the Lord and receive Christ, guess what? You are now planted into the family of God. You are one of his many different trees. Amen? And so you have to understand, when you become planted in the family of God, do you realize that there's some things that God expects from you? Do you understand that once you become planted in the family of God, that he expects growth? He's not happy with retardation. Stunted growth. He doesn't want that. He wants us to grow. He wants us to prosper. So he expects growth. How many of y'all also know he expects change? He don't want you to be the way you were prior to saying yes. He expects change from us as his children. So he expects growth. He expects change. Not immediately, but eventually. He already knows that the moment you say yes, He's not going to see a change immediately. The only thing that changes when you say yes to God immediately is your position in him. You are now in Christ. Not an enemy of the cross, but you're in Christ. You will go to heaven even though you're still here on the earth when you transition because of your saying yes to the Lord. You know that you have a spot reserved for you. Amen. But he also knows at that moment. Everything that you used to do, it ain't going away just like that. You don't change immediately, but he really does expect you to change. Sometimes when we look at our lives and how long we've been saved and some of the things that we're doing, he's like, what's up? I planted you a long time ago. What's up? And so he expects growth. He expects change, not immediately, but eventually. And so in God's garden, he has a special seed to help you to grow. In the garden of God, he has a special seed to actually help us all to grow. And every tree that is planted in God's garden gets the exact same seed. It's not 50 different types. We get the same exact seed. So why is it that some grow and some don't? Because the reality is we all are trees planted in God's garden. And some ain't bearing no fruit, looking real barren. And you got others that are just blossoming. Why? And we all are getting the same exact thing. Well, I'm just going to take you to a word that you already are familiar with. Amen. Uh, but I want to share with you on the day, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It's James chapter 1. I know y'all probably thought I was going to the parable of the sower, but no, I'm not. <laughs> that ain't the seed that I'm talking about, even though it is the word of God. Amen. The special seed that God has for us is the word of God. And every tree that is planted in his kingdom, in the family of God, gets the same word. The word. The word. Just like year after year, week after week, everybody comes into the house of the Lord. And everybody in this room hears the same exact word and some grow and some don't. But we got to say why. One thing about it, you can get the special seed that God has prepared for all of his trees that are planted in his special garden. But if you don't do anything with that special seed that God gives you, then guess what? Nothing's going to happen. Because the reason why some grow and some don't is because there are individuals that refuse to apply 
the word and change. James chapter 1, starting at verse 21, the New Living Translation. So the word says, so get rid of all the filth. Get rid of everything that's not like God. Get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. And humbly accept the special seed, the word of God. And humbly accept the word God has planted in your heart. Whoo. Guess what, y'all? This sentence right here is powerful. For it has the power to save your souls. It has the power to change your life. It has the power to totally transform you as the opening scripture was read about being transformed and changed. The word of God has the ability to do that. Coming back from the eagle's nest yesterday and we riding in the car and you know, Elder Janetta has some questions. You know, sometimes, you know, people take advantage of riding with you. They want to pull all kind of stuff out of you, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> but she really wanted to know, you know, she, she's heard my story before, and she wanted to know, well, you told your story of how you got off track and you found yourself back in the club and doing this and that. She wanted to know, for real, what really happened? What, what, what really took place? And I told, and I went through the process of telling her the story, and I said, but I'm in a place now where I've learned from my state, and I understand the power of my relationship with God. Because I was able to get off track and begin to do all type of filthy things that I should have no longer went back to, only because of the fact that I got off a track in my personal relationship with the Lord. Things that really kept me rooted and grounded, I got away from. And so the next thing you know, I found myself in a backslidden state. And I told her, I am so, I am so, my, my relationship with God, y'all, is everything to me. Everything to me. I think about the song. I played a song in the car, a song that when I first gave my life to the Lord, it's by Yolanda Adams, I'm free. You might want to get that up or something. Uh, Yolanda Adams for the end of this message but that particular song was a song that ministered to my heart and I loved it at that moment because I could think of the bondage that I was in and I could think about how God and his word had changed me and even as we was riding in the car last night and I was listening to the song and I began to sing that song that song means so much to me because it talk about I got a brand new way of living I got a brand new talk I got a brand new walk it's Only the word of God that keeps me, not just knowing it. Because a lot of people know it. But it's about living it. It's about applying it. I don't care if you like a walking concordance. I don't care if you can rehearse the whole Bible from beginning to end. If you don't apply it, your life is not going to change. I was just simply telling her that I value my relationship with the Lord and where I am. I know what it takes to go back. And I refuse to go back. But one thing I know for sure is if I do, it's because of me. Because ain't nothing wrong with God's word. Absolutely nothing. And so it says... So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your heart for it has the power to save your soul. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Because guess what? You ain't fooling me. You ain't fooling others. You may be trying to fool yourself into thinking that you good when you far from good. You're fooling yourself. Don't think that you can know this word and don't apply it and you all good. Somebody in this place say the devil is a bona fide liar. The devil is a bona fide liar. Yeah, he is. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey... It is like glancing at your face in the mirror. 
You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. How, don't that sound crazy, don't it? That sounds crazy. If I look in the mirror and I see myself in the mirror and I walk away and I forget what I look like, that sounds crazy. And he's trying to let you know it's crazy when you get the word and don't apply it. That's what he's letting you know. He's using an example that your natural mind can say, that's crazy. That don't even make sense. Well, guess what? It don't make sense that you would get the word and don't apply it. And so it says, you see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you up free, and if you do, if you do, if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. When you think about it, you will see the fruit that will come from your obedience. And so, even as my husband was just prompted in his spirit to talk about it, it ain't about just coming to church. I was like, he all in some of the things that I got written down. So again, you think about it. The word of God is important. Hearing it and applying it and obeying it is what we need to do. And so we need to understand, showing up, showing up to church on a regular basis or sporadic, because some just don't show up on a regular basis, but showing up to church on a regular basis or sporadically, reading your Bible, doing your daily devotions, praying or fasting will not change you without obedience. You can pray and fast every time you turn around, but if you don't obey, it's vanity. You can show up at church on a regular basis, but refuse to apply the word of God to your life. It's vanity. You won't change. You can do all 500 Bible devotions back to back to back to back. Sometimes we get addicted to stuff. Sometimes we people, some, some people just get addicted to showing up, but ain't addicted to changing. And so you can do all of those things. You can read your word all the time because you, oh, Jesus. Because <laughs> some people just religious. See, some people can just sit and hear a word like this and pat themselves on the back, you know, thinking about the fact that, you know, I, I, I pray all the time and, you know, I read my word and I know I'm faithful, but you ain't changing. You ain't changing. A whole bunch of religious folks know how to do that. I say time and time again, some of you came out your mama's womb going to the church. You've been in church all your life. But guess what? Church ain't changed you. It's the difference between religious and relationship. And the Lord, y'all know he's had me in a vein. And I was talking to a woman the other day and she was talking about questioning somebody's love. Right? Their love for God based off of what they was doing. I said, let me slow your road. I say because at the end of the day, a lot of people do love God. There's a lot of believers that love God. The problem was lacking in their life is intimacy. I know I was fussing my kids sometime and, you know, had conversations and dealing with them. And I, I, I do love God. You know me and, and I come up with the scripture. The words say, if you love me, keep my commandments. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of individuals in the body of Christ that do love God. But they lack intimacy. Intimacy makes the difference. And I had to bring it to her attention. I said a lot of times you can get into a relationship and that person can love you. But that don't, that don't mean that they know how to be intimate with you. They don't know how to be intimate with you spiritually, emotionally, or even physically. But they love you. And they will tell you straight up that they love you. And you know in your heart that they love you. But guess what? Your relationship ain't good because the intimacy ain't right. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Work that right there. <laughs> Work that right there. Work that right there with some, with marriage. Come on now. Or, or your boyfriend, whoever you've been with, you shouldn't be physically intimate, but you can still be emotionally intimate and you can still be spiritually intimate, but you don't need to be physically intimate with your boyfriend or girlfriend. You hear that? Amen. Amen. 
But when you think about it, a relationship, you got two people that love each other. But they got problems in their marriage. And the reason they got problems in their marriage is because their intimacy is jacked up. But as soon as they get the intimacy right in their marriage, it makes everything better. It's the same thing with your relationship with God. Your life sometimes can be jacked up because your intimacy is off. Yes, you love God, but your intimacy is off. But once you get that intimate peace in right. order, everything is going to come together. Oh, yeah, baby. We're in a real good place. And it has a lot to do with his intimate relationship with the Lord as he shared earlier. We've been together this year. will make 20 years. But he has seen the fruit of intimacy. If you heard Pastor Mitchell this morning, that's all he was talking about. What's the fruit that has come from the intimacy? So a lot of people do love God. But because intimacy is lacking, the relationship ain't that good. Because don't nobody want to be in a relationship where the intimacy is jacked up. Do y'all realize that that makes the worst relationship harder? Yes. Yes. It makes it harder. It makes you question it. It makes it difficult. But when that peace, that intimate peace, gets right, it's so much easier. You see me with new eyes, don't you, baby? All right. Let me, let me get back to the word. But, again, showing up to church on a regular or sporadic basis, reading your Bible, doing daily devotions, praying or fasting will not change you without obedience. In the past, because we started out with the message last week, the past versus the present. In the past, that's what many people have done. In the past, let's just say 2019. Let's just say that's been your pattern yesterday. The years before that, you may have had the pattern of showing up to church. You may have had the pattern of, I read my word all the time. You had the pattern of, I pray and talk to God all the time. You have the pattern of doing all those things, but for real, you haven't obeyed. You haven't changed because you refuse to obey. And so in the past, that's what many people have done. Saved and still singing the I know song. Mm -hmm. Saved and still singing, I know, I know, I know, I know I need to change, I know, I know I need to change, I know, but, and that just ends it all right there. All them excuses. And so singing that song, it has gotten old. It's like a broken record. But can I tell y'all a secret? Y'all ready? Can I tell y'all a secret? Okay, I'm going to this. God is loving. God is patient. God is merciful. And God is so gracious. That's what I want to tell you. He's loving. God is patient. God is merciful. And God is gracious. But must we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. God wants to see real change in your life. Turn your Bibles, if you can, to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, and I'm just about done with the word. Luke chapter 13, and we're going to start at verse 6. Again, reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Luke 13, and I'm going to start at verse 6. Keep in mind about the vine dresser and God being the God and all of that. Amen. But what you have to understand is that God wants to see real change in your life in this season of your life. The I know lack of fruit is over. The I know 
lack of fruit is over. What you have to understand is that it frustrates God. Sometimes we don't think God is bothered by things that we do, but I want you to know it does frustrate God because he wants more from you. They sung the song. I said, thank you, Jesus. He wants it all today. We need to understand that he wants all of you. God wants you to change. Luke 13, starting at verse 6. He also, Jesus that is, spoke this parable. And he said, a certain man had a fig tree. You that tree. I said, once we get saved, we get planted in God's garden. So think about this tree. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vine, vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and he found none. You planted, you saved, now here it is, the, the vine dresser, the garden, he's looking, he looking for some fruit. You just said yes to me, where's the change at? Because I, 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 I know I should see something right about now. And so, he came. The tree was planted. It said a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years, for three years, three years, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. For three years, I've been looking. All right, you planted it three years ago. What's up? Why is it bearing? Why isn't it bearing any fruit? I've come and find none. And guess what he said? Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Taking up space. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered. Here's your apostle crying out to the Lord. As the one that he come and asked questions to. And he said, he answered and he said to him, please, sir. Let it alone this year also. Let it alone this year also. Until I dig around it and fertilize it. Give me an opportunity to try to work with it again. To try to bring forth some fruit. Give, 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 me, a, give me a chance. Because I know you frustrated. You got me in position to take care of the garden. You got me in position to, to, to oversee these trees. And I know you frustrated because you're looking for certain fruit. And guess what? I, I, I'm giving them all your word. The special thing that they need to fertilize them and cause them to grow. I'm giving it to them. But yet, I know you're frustrated because you said, but what's up with this? I'm tired of this. Where's the fruit? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. You can cut it down. He was saying, give me, give me another chance. Give me another opportunity. Because I know you, I know you're frustrated because you ain't seen no change yet. You, you, you've been looking for fruit in the lives of certain people, and they, they faithfully hear you, they know your word, they've been saved a long time. Cutting it down don't mean going to hell. Sometimes cutting it down is like I ain't got no use for you. I ain't got no use for you. I can't do nothing with you. Because you ain't productive. He wants us to bear fruit. And so, in my clothes, I'm just going to share with you what the Lord had me to write out. As Moses would cry out to God for mercy for the children of Israel. Because if you go back and you read the scriptures, God got to the point, I'm tired of my people. I done brought them out of bondage. I'm trying to show them a better life and take them to the promised land. But they got all these complaints and all these excuses and all these reasons. I'm tired of them. I'm doing away with them. 
And Moses will hear the frustration of God. And he will cry out to God on behalf of the people that was frustrating God. And so as Moses will cry out to God for mercy for the children of Israel, I plead to God on your behalf as your leader. I go in the face of God on your behalf as your leader. Because I know there's some stuff that God is tired of. And so I go to God on behalf as your leader. If you have been in tune to me as your leader, you have been hearing my cry for true intimacy to come forth in the lives of those that are connected to this ministry. I've been saying it over and over and I've been pushing it over and over. And so if you have been in tune, you have been hearing my cry for true intimacy to come forth in your lives when it comes down to your relationship with God. That is the only thing that will produce change. It is the only thing that will produce change. Showing up all the time and refusing to change is like wasting time. Being in church for years but refusing to change, it's like time wasted. There's so much that you can be doing for the Lord. There's so much peace that you could be experiencing with the Lord as you draw closer to him. And so that is the only thing that will produce change in your lives and it is the only thing that will keep you. It's the only thing, again, that will produce change, and it's the only thing that will keep you. I am only kept because of my intimacy. I'm a kept woman. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm only kept because of my intimacy with God, because guess what? If that lacks again, I know what's to come. And so I have been speaking this word in this house for about three years. If you really go back and look at the time frame, it's going on three years of this same message of intimacy, drawing closer. And so I've been speaking this word in this house for the last few years, and this is not just the word for nothing but the truth ministries because God showed me that this is a kingdom word. This is a problem that is going on in the kingdom of God. A lot of people that love God but lack intimacy. Yeah. And when you lack intimacy, you live carnal. Yeah. Ain't no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You live carnal. When you lack intimacy, you don't give them a full yes. You, 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 you don't give them all of you. You don't surrender. And so, and even though Moses, he pleaded with God on behalf of of the children of Israel. And how many of y'all know. That there was times that God. Heard Moses cry. And he extended grace. He extended mercy. He had compassion. It wasn't because of the people. It was because of the prayers of the leader. Some people don't even realize. That the hand of God has been kept on their life or they've been protected, not because of anything that they've done. It's been the prayers of your leader that has been praying God's protection over your life in the midst of your foolishness. It's been the prayers of your leaders that stop God from doing what he wanted to do with you because he's got sick and tired of you. But your leader cried out, Lord, don't do it! And God said, okay. I ain't I'm going to back up. I'm going to back up. But I'm tired. But I'm going to back up. Only because I hear your prayers. Because the prayers of the righteous availeth much. And even though Moses pleaded with God and God extended grace and mercy, how many of y'all know the people took God for granted? They would have their moments, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. No, Lord, no, Lord. Yes, Lord, today. No, Lord, not after service. Yes, Lord. 
right now. I mean, you know, he would, you know, they would be so sincere, snotting and all this other stuff. I told somebody else the other day too. I said not long ago. I said, I don't get moved by a whole bunch of emotions. I don't get moved. Today was a beautiful service. That don't move me. Change moved me. Because how many of y'all know I've seen God move so many times? The presence of the Lord was definitely in here. Amen. Without a shadow of a doubt. Amen. I have seen God move on people and use people mightily and all type of stuff so many times. But I have seen the fact that the individuals ain't changed their life. That don't move me. Fruit moves me. Fruit moves God. Because sometimes people just are in a moment of emotionalism. But they still don't have a heart to change. And so even though Moses pleaded with God and he extended grace and mercy, the people took God for granted. They would straighten up for a minute. And guess what? They would go right back to their old ways. The Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you don't have to go there, but if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that is a passage of scripture that talks about how God had the children of Israel and how they all got the same spiritual food, how they all got the same spiritual drink. But he talked about how thousands of them died in one day because of disobedience and all type of stuff. When he talked in that scripture, he put that in the scripture, he put it there for a reason. And so the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 that all the things that happened to them were examples for us. Everything that the children of Israel went through, not making it to the promised land of many of them. Dying off in their disobedience. God put it in his word as an example for us. It said that all the things that happened to them were examples for us not to follow and to learn from their mistakes. It was written down in the Bible to warn us and it said that it was written to warn us. They were examples to us as to what not to do. And so I'm just strongly encouraging you to make this a true season of change in your life. So that when the gardener comes back and inspects next year, he'll see some fruit. He'll see some good fruit. Lord, I'm pushing intimacy. Because I know what it will do. I know you see, Lord, even things that I don't see. Because, but you've let me know your frustrations. Give them another chance. Give them another year. To get it right for real. It's time. And so I'm just strongly encouraging you to make this a true season of change in your life. So that when the gardener inspects you again, he will see the fruit that he knows that you can produce. He knows what's in you. But it's only going to come out based on what you do. He wants to see what's in you come out. And the fruit that he wants to see is the fruit of change. Repeat after me. I know I need to change. I know I need to change. But if I don't change, but if I don't change, I will never change. I will never change. Thank you, those of you all that are taking this opportunity to tune into our Sunday morning worship service. I pray that this message has been a blessing to you. And I pray that when God comes to inspect you, that he will even see fruit produced in your life. The barren season for the saints is over. We've been saved too long, yet unproductive. And so I pray that this word ministers to your spirit. If you want to know more about this ministry, feel free to go to our website, www.nbttministries.com. Be blessed and enjoy your day. You can stop though, sir, and then I want you to play that song for the people of God because I want you to really...